Okay. Thank you. Well, my wife is in the audience, so, so please do not fall asleep because it's not nice for me afterwards. Um, I would like to open by quoting from the recent memoir of our first distinguished speaker today, Mr. Blair, and I get no commission for that. Reflecting, reflecting on his experience with non-governmental organizations, INGOs, Mr. Blair wrote, over time, I'm afraid, I came to dislike part of the NGO culture. The trouble with some of them is that while they are treated by the media as concerned, concerned citizens, which of course they are, they are also organizations raising money, marketing themselves, and competing with other NGOs in a similar field. Because their entire raison d'etre is to get policy changed, they can hardly say, yes, we've done it, without putting themselves out of business. And they've learned to play the modern media game perfectly. As it's all about impact, they shout louder and louder to get heard. Balance is not in the vocabulary. It's all outrage, betrayal, crisis. They also have their own tightly de defined dogmas and conventional wisdom, which if you challenge them, they defend fiercely, not usually on their merits, but by abusing your motives for challenging them. As we shall see, there is far more to the activity of some INGOs than that. The violent clash that took place on board the Mavi Marmara was a watershed mark with far-reaching consequences. Yes, it is, it is doubtful whether the various committees formed to probe the incident have the ability or intention to situate it in its broader context and suggest its global ramifications regarding the objectives and influence of some of the leading players in today's global arena, the international non-governmental organizations, INGOs. The media already dealt extensively with the identity of the organization behind the Freedom Flotilla, the Humanitarian Re Relief Foundation, or IHH. Established in Turkey in 1992, this INGO purports to offer aid to Muslims around the world. It has even been granted the honor of consultative status by the UN ECOSOC, the most distinguished status an INGO can obtain under, recent, under, under current international arrangements. A position, by the way, it holds until this very day. Behind this humanitarian facade, however, lurks an activism of a very different kind. Evidence gathered by security services and research institutes in, Tur in Turkey, Europe, and the United States points to the IHA's elaborate connection with Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and possibly the Hezbollah, and the assistance it provided to Islamic, Islamic militias in Afghanistan, Chechnya, and Bosnia. It is easy to dismiss the IHH as merely one bad apple, but the truth is slightly more complex. The world of INGOs is an exceedingly intricate system of bodies that operate in different ways and serve a variety of goals. Some, some act, of, act, act of, out of sincere universal concern, seeking to protect groups suffering from discrimination and oppression, while others are motivated by an antagonistic ideological agenda, assuming a particular side of political, social, or economic power struggles. The positions and methods that characterize some of these organizations suggest that the, that the Gaza flotilla may, may well herald a significant escalation in their activities and not just against Israel. Undoubtedly, one of the prominent characteristics of the current era is the sweeping change in the role played by INGOs. These actors no away at the power of nation states, effectively exploiting modern, in, modern information channels and confidence gaps between citizens and their governments for their needs. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Médecins Sans Frontières, and Greenpeace are only few of the countless INGOs active in the world today. Their number grew, their number grew from 6,000 6, 6, in 1990 to 26,000 in 1999, and over the past decade had swelled to reach an astonishing 40,000. Many are politically supported and funded by intergovernmental institutions such as the UN, European agencies, particularly the EU, and individuals. The remarkable flourishing of these organizations and the con constant pressure they apply to governments and international bodies in the name of humanitarian goals have given the impression that they constitute a sort of global civil society 
an amorphous, supranational, all-embracing social or political entity that ostensibly advances democratization processes, protects human rights, and assists peacemaking in regions of conflict. Unfortunately, in too many cases, the image has very little to do with reality. To be sure, the vigorous activism of, of the INGOs contributes to the, the decentralization, decentralization of power and hinders the oppressive conduct of states. However, in contrast with most governments with whom they clash, these organizations are not elected bodies, are not founded on the principle of representation, and are not in any way accountable to the public. This fact raises serious concerns regarding the legality and legitimacy of their activity and calls into question their ability or willingness to follow the rules of the democratic game. Hostility toward the West, and in particular Israel and the United States, is rampant in the global civil society. It serves as a common cause for radical leftist organizations and militant Islamic movements, often with the legitimacy of the UN and other, and other international institutions. Moreover, a number of NGOs are not content with simply expressing sympathy for terrorism. Experts already point to the possibility that many INGOs are exploited by terror networks as easy points of infiltration into the civic space. As early as 1996, the CIA published a report about the extensive relationship between terrorists and INGOs. The report, which expressly mentions the IHH, maintains that efforts by governments to counter terrorist groups' use of NGOs are complicated by domestic and international political concerns, legal constraints, and the size and flexibility of the international extremist network. Various studies sponsored by the European Commission from the last few years have further exposed the deepening involvement of such NGOs in militant activities throughout Europe, which includes funding, recruitment of activists, and ideological backing. And yet, even with a number of disturbing violent precedents in mind, the Gaza flotilla constitutes a significant development, though allegedly an act of defiance against Israel's policy toward the Palestinian population of Gaza, the flotilla was in fact something far more dramatic than that. It was a challenge to the fundamental principles of world order. This world order is based primarily on the recognition of equality between sovereign states and the demand to respect their territorial integrity, on the understanding that conflicts must be resolved through peaceful means, and on the perception of the state as the agent that holds the monopoly on the use of force. Unfortunately, this information and media manipulations obscure the fact that the bloody skirmish on board the Mavi Marmara reflected an, an inevitable clash between two conflicting systems of, of value, the traditional state-centric approach, which has guided world politics for hundreds of years, and an alarmingly bold radical appro approach that challenges the authority of the sovereign nation.